And when I heard about this, I was so shocked because I really didn't know how to handle this forfeiture thing. Because one of the things of these people are actually refugees and, and, and a lot of our veterans too. Um, a colonel uh, had three marijuana cigarettes in his car and, and, and he was a retired colonel. And he would stop and he had his grandchildren in the back seat and they were um, in, a, in something in the vehicle and the police saw it. And uh, first they confiscated his car, and later they went to his home and they took, seized his 124 acre dairy farm that was his family's because he had three plants going there. Now, I know this is against the law, I know it's illegal, but in my 24 months of study, I've had to set my personal feelings aside as a leader and educate myself and gain knowledge about what the facts of this plan, this seed, it really is. And I have seen untold people's lives totally destroyed because of forfeiture of their car, their house, their family, and suicides. Besides losing my own son and many friends of mine because they could not get to a, a, an option, they didn't even have an option, and they and they went ahead and drank on top of their meds and silly things like that. They're in, they ended up dead, or they were so despondent over losing everything they ever had. And um, it's hard for a lot of people to understand that. And we all know it's against the law, and so did they. But they were just trying to get a real, little relief. And I beg you, Senators, to please consider this as a humanitarian gesture, because the way of the future is this direction I really do believe. Right, thanks, sir. And most importantly, we're very grateful for your service. Uh, thank you for being here today. Are there any questions for this witness? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to testify in support of 70761? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Stephen Panty. I'm uh, my career from St. Louis. I went to college at the University of Missouri Columbia and now work in Kansas City. And about six years ago, seven years ago, I started a nonprofit watchdog organization called Americans for Forfeiture Reform to, issue, to address issues specifically of asset forfeiture. Um, and the issue was uh, particularly relevant to the citizens of Columbia, where I was residing at the time uh, back then. Uh, because you see, in 2004, which is a year after I went to the university, uh, the citizens of Columbia, by ballot initiative in the presidential election, passed two, two ordinances, uh, one a medical cannabis ordinance, and one a second a decriminalization of cannabis ordinance. So theoretically, in the city of Columbia, you are protected from arrest um, if you either have an, either a doctor's recommendation or a misdemeanor amount of cannabis on you. And this, is, this ordinance is generally worked as intended. It's really for law enforcement to focus on violent crimes and uh, crimes of property. And it's for these sort of the, the load of, of, of booking and, and incarcerating even for, for minor possession of cannabis crimes. In 2009, excuse me, 2010, in February of 2010, the Columbia Police Department uh, raided the house of, I forget the gentleman's name, but it was a Kinlock truck, about four miles from my house in Columbia. And they raided it at night at 8, 8 p.m. on a Tuesday. Uh, they went in guns blazing and killed two dogs. And it and, and captured the incident on film for training purposes. When the Columbia Tribune got this uh, footage, it was, it was an international incident. And or it, was, it got international publicity, and suddenly there was a major outcry on the issue. You know, we had passed by a voter initiative a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, an ordinance that said that our police department should treat cannabis crimes as the lowest priority, uh, yet they're sending uh, our law enforcers into dangerous situations at night in homes where their children present, uh, and these are really aggressive militaristic raids. So one of the things that happened after that raid was there was a lot of, lot of uh, community outcry. Uh, our newly appointed police chief, Ken Burton, was, uh, who is a friend of mine, and, uh, he did an extraordinary job reaching out to the community and listening to our concerns, which resulted in a policy change at our police department, which was that the SWAT team would be only used in violent situations as opposed to uh, you know, uh, non-violent cannabis situations. And we, one of the things we did is we went to the circuit court and got the SWAT records for the last three years, from, I think uh, 2009 or uh, uh, 2011 to 2008 or so. Um, and we found about half of the raids in our, in our city were over marijuana. 
And we look at some of them, it becomes some interesting patterns, like the, uh, the radar and Kinlock house that, that made the news, uh, they've actually gotten the warrant about a week, not eight days earlier, but they waited eight days. And we asked, and we found this to be a pattern. They would typically wait several days before, um, after they got a warrant to actually wait at the facility. Um, and we're starting to have to take questions at this Yeah, go ahead. Are there any questions for this witness? I do have one for you. Uh, sorry I didn't cut you off, but we have a lot of testimony yeah. today. Um, the right that you mentioned, were there children present? Yes. Was there any concern raised that there was marijuana in the home or children in there? The citizens of Columbia have generally uh, accepted the use of medical cannabis, which is why we have an ordinance. Um, so typically, we don't want children to have access to cannabis or uh, but we do. The, the citizens do understand that there is a, a use and a value for this, um, and we would. And I'm actually working with the city council and the city manager right now to push out a policy resolution to this deliberative body endorsing uh, the legislature's action in medical cannabis. So we want to see it properly regulated. We don't want to see kids getting into it. Um, in this building, you have to understand that most of the time we hear the things for the children. Mm -hmm. So you raise the prospect of children. I certainly have to ask the opposing question. Absolutely. If there was if there was marijuana in the home, I would assume that there would be some sort of concern raised if there were children present. We we certainly don't want children having you know uh, unrestricted access to cannabis. We, we think that such, uh, such things are best uh, uh, done through doctors, uh, uh, doctors advice and and, uh, and parental oversight. Um, we we don't we don't Columbia generally doesn't think that the presence of cannabis in a home is a uh, danger to children if the children don't have easy access to it. It's appropriately contained. No, that's like pharmaceuticals to make sure that they have more lock tabs on top of those. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm just, I just want to raise the obvious question. I'm sure most of the members might be thinking I can't speak for them. But, um, in this case, uh, Senator, the uh, grant of cannabis that was found in the rate was insane. Okay, thank you. Senator Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess to, to uh, follow up on Senator Jensen's question, um, as a physician, I, I, I spent a lot of time warning parents about the dangers of secondhand smoke. And cannabis smoke is not innocuous. We, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I, I would uh, support any of the cannabis from children, but I think that there is clear science that demonstrates the medical utility of cannabis for children. Um, in non smoke form, so cannabis oil. So, well, we're not talking about stigmas, we're talking about kids who just have like lungs and can do things like breathe. Sure. <laughs> and at and, 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 and a point, uh, I, can, I can certainly find some model perhaps for you on, on uh, exactly what's in cannabis. But I don't you're, you're, you're going to answer that. You're going to tell me that cannabis smoke, secondhand, that our milk smoke is safe for kids to inhale? I, I, just for a second, I everyone smokes, they cook it. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, just this idea that it's okay to have cannabis or cannabis. You know, I, I think that it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable position to say that, that you shouldn't smoke cannabis or alcohol. <clears throat> okay. Um, these forfeitures, are, 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 are all of the state or are a lot of It's my understanding a lot of them are federal. Well, they are federal, but uh, recently the Department of Justice has uh, suspended the equitable sharing program that would allow the transfer to the federal government of uh, property in the states. And the reason why is because in the last over the last year, Congress has rescinded about a billion point two dollars from the federal asset forfeiture fund, which put the stability of that fund in, in, in some uh, question. So the Department of Justice made a policy decision to suspend that program. Uh, in effect, meaning that the only forfeitures happen at the federal level are not being shared with the states, uh, which means that the federal government gets to keep 100 percent of the revenues. No, but I'm just here when we hear about asset forfeitures, because I've, I've heard of quite a few of the press now. Uh, are we generally hearing about federal forfeitures, which which anything we do in this building when it goes back? Are we mostly hearing about state forfeitures? Well. There's a relationship because uh, here in Missouri we have a law that says that asset forfeiture revenues go to the school building construction fund, sure. the revolving school fund. Sure. And so the federal, uh, uh, so, but, but that changes <clears throat> if you have a federal agent or your task force is working has some kind of federal contact. So 
Uh, a lot of these monies you know, go through the circular, this uh, circuitous uh, channel to avoid getting into the school building revolving fund, which raises issues of both executive um, uh, prioritization and, and policy. Uh, because essentially what we're talking about is executive branch agencies that are self-funding themselves outside of the appropriation process. <laughs> so independent of any discussion of cannabis or drugs or or, uh, or other issues, I think it's a significant issue that this legislature should address in terms of reasserting its power of the first over these revenue streams. In case you heard me wrong, you were just slot in um, Was there a question of these? The, the property being occupied by drug dealers because drug dealers once in a while have guns, have shotgun traps, and all sorts of things. There's a lot of shotguns in these areas, Senator. Um, but typically, uh, in this in the case in this case specific case, there was no surveillance done to in indicate that there were children present or that there was any kind of violent situation. <laughs> typically, you want to have some surveillance done. Now, it depends with the. Uh, 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 officer who was a SWAT commander, his name is Tom Dreser, and he's now uh, 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 mm -hmm. got a position with the historical police uh, here in the, the historical side in Park Police here in the state. And I talked to him about this recently because we kept in touch. You know, we were, uh, you know, we had very direct communication after these incidents. And, and he, you know, he, he'll sit, he sat down with me the other day and at lunch and he said, you know, I'm, I'm 55 years old and you know, I did this for a long time and here I am asking, what effect have I had? And uh, you know, I think there's an emerging sense in law enforcement that some of the, these war and drug policies, including cannabis prohibition and asset forfeiture, have, have done something that's damaged the relationship between our citizens and our law enforcers um, and their, and their uh, uh, legislative bodies. And I think that having a system that uh, has a fair sentencing process and not- Okay, I know that's your testimony. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying, Criticizing law enforcement in this case for you know, using no, no, SWAT. No, no, no. If there was evidence that this was a drug ring or what happened, if there was evidence, it would be different than if it were just possession. I agree with that. Yeah, and our police okay. chief Ken Burton made that policy change. He only used SWAT in violent uh, sure. situations and he supported the moment. Thank you. Any other questions, Senator? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question. So, I know that there's a lot of all leaders conservative. All leaders in Congress who address asset forfeiture. Mike, Senator Mike Lee, I know is okay. talking about this. Um, who not in just truth, in the state of Missouri, um, who bears the burden of proof with an asset forfeiture case? You know, the, I, I believe, uh, so when you have an asset, I, I believe this, uh, uh, there, there's an assumption. Um, so under civil asset forfeiture, the burden of proof is generally effectively re reversed. You have to typically prove the innocence. Yeah, that's what that's my understanding. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Essentially. All right. Thanks. Any other questions? <clears throat> Sir, thank you very much for your testimony. No. Is there anyone else here to testify in support of Senate Bill 761? <laughs> Yes, good afternoon. My name is Dan Beats. I'm an attorney in private practice. I've practiced criminal defense law throughout the state of Missouri for the past 30 years. I've represented many people who were the targets of forfeiture efforts. Um, I think that this bill is a very wise proposal. It's clear that the marijuana policy of this nation is evolving and changing rapidly. Uh, two Gallup polls have shown support for uh, a different approach to marijuana, <coughs> a different approach to regulating and taxing cannabis as we do alcohol. You know, it's kind of ironic that we call marijuana a controlled substance because indeed it is an uncontrolled substance while it remains prohibited just as alcohol was really totally uncontrolled during the 20s and early 30s when we experimented with prohibition of that substance. But specifically as to forfeiture, I think it's important to understand that Although we passed some significant reforms of our forfeiture laws back in the early 1990s, that people who commit rather minor offenses are still subject to losing some or all of their property. For instance, I represent a man in St. Clair County a few years back with no prior criminal history whatsoever. He had grown a single marijuana plant. And the prosecutor in St. Clair County, not the one who sits now, but a former prosecutor there, attempted to take his entire farm. It was a small farm. It was an inheritance from his parents. He'd grown one marijuana plant on that farm. The prosecutor actually tried to take the whole farm away from him based on 
one plant. Um, I, I represented a man up in Sheridan County several years before then, and another man who had no prior criminal history whatsoever. He worked a day job in construction, he worked nights at his sister's bar, and he was the target for no particular reason, apparently, of an undercover female agent who lured him out of the parking lot one night and had begged him for weeks to get her a joint. He finally got her one joint, they smoked it together, and because he left the roach with her, he was charged with a class B felony of, of distribution of controlled substance, and there's there's nothing in the law that says that can't be charged that way. You know, here's some other examples under Missouri law right now. If you possess any more than one and one quarter ounces, if you have one and one half ounces of marijuana, you're committing a felony offense. If you attempt to do that, you're committing a felony offense. If you if you um, attempt to sprout a single seed. You put a seed on a wet paper towel and, and you're trying to sprout that seed, that is a class B felony offense. And, and as I just pointed out in Sheriff County's case, passing a joint can be charged as distribution. These are all felony offenses, and the significance of that is that under our corporate laws, it requires that the defendant be convicted of a felony offense before that person's property can be taken. But it doesn't take much, again, merely the attempt to do any of those things uh, can indeed be charged as a felony. I'd be glad to answer any questions if I can. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Yeah, so I don't understand the process. So, um, in that circumstance where um, the farmer grows the plant, um, um, charges are pursued by the prosecutor. What is the what is the legal process for the for the actual forfeiture of the asset? Is that that's a separate proceeding? <coughs> it is. And the burden, who bears the burden of proof? Well, that is an interesting question. Uh, a presumption of forfeitability arises if there's a controlled substance in proximity to whatever they're trying to take. So I mean, if, if there's marijuana on your farm, if there's a plant on your farm, then a presumption of forfeitability arises, and that shifts the burden of proof to the defendant to try to prove that even though there was a controlled substance there, it, it really shouldn't be forfeited. So I hope that answers the question. That's my understanding of the law. That's the way I've seen it work. So, in that, so we first said this is what my understanding is. I'm just trying to confirm this. Maybe some other witnesses will testify this fact too. In those instances, the, the, the defendant, unlike any other criminal sort of prosecution, the defendant bears the burden of proof on the state. Yes, okay. at that point, and 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 of course, not beyond a reasonable doubt that's required. A mere probability that the property was used to facilitate a crime. In other words, if you grew a plant on your farm, is enough to justify a forfeiture. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Senator, I just wanted to repeat some questions to the earlier witness. Um, how many of these forfeitures are federal versus state? I don't know the answer. I wish we knew the answer to that question. And I think the previous speaker was correct that at least up until recently, most state forfeitures have been handed off by our, our state police agencies to federal authorities to evade the reforms that this body passed back in about 1993 or 4. You know, under Missouri law, you have to actually be convicted of a crime. Under federal law, you don't even have to be charged with a crime for your property to be taken and kept. Under Missouri law, you you know, the forfeiture cannot proceed until the criminal case is completed. But under federal law, there is no such impediment, and they can go right ahead with that. And the previous speaker was correct, too, in saying our Constitution and I, since at least 1945, has required that the proceeds of forfeiture go to support education. When law enforcement evades and violates arguably that constitutional provision, they're depriving education of that money and instead spending it on what they choose to spend it on. There's no real accountability for how that money is spent. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else to testify support? Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Jeanette Monox, we're testifying with support on behalf of the Power of Missouri. Our Human Rights Task Force and Board of Directors have been studying issues related to marijuana laws for a while and uh, especially became aware of this forfeiture problem uh, when many of us read the book, uh, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, which we would highly recommend. Any questions for Jeanette? Thank you very much. Anyone else to testify support?
Generosity of the ACLU of Missouri, just going on record in support. Yes. Others in support, last call. Anyone who testified in opposition, then no sense. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I am Eric Zahn. I am the Platte County Prosecutor Attorney. I'm here on behalf of the Missouri Association of Prosecutor Attorneys. We respectfully but very strongly oppose this bill, which would take money from school children to enrich drug traffickers. That's all we do. Because, with all due respect to the senator, it's not possible for a police station to be built with Missouri forfeiture funds because 100% of those funds go to Missouri City schools and kids. That is possible under the federal equitable charity program as it used to exist for some of those federal funds to come back to the state. That program also no longer exists. But here's, here's the most important point. Marijuana is illegal in the state of Missouri and even at the federal level, although the current Justice Department has decided not to enforce those laws because it is dangerous. Unlike the senator, I'm not a doctor, uh, but I do, I do trust doctors with to study this issue. Let me tell you what um, the American Medical uh, Association, um, they uh, dedicated an entire edition of the AMA Journal to marijuana. The lead editor said this, we have empathy for those who have suffered serious pain or discomfort and seek therapeutic relief. However, despite the actions of several states on this issue, there is no reliable scientific evidence that smoke marijuana provides such therapy. The fact of the matter is, marijuana remains a Schedule I controlled substance with no medical use because the FDA has not found any use. There's a myth that marijuana is a non dangerous drug. But the facts are, it is dangerous. The studies that are now coming out about marijuana show that the long term cognitive deficits as a result of marijuana use by children um, are significant. Um, long term decreases in uh, IQ increases in psychotic illness and a host of other physical and mental problems associated with marijuana use. We don't have to look any further than Colorado and Washington to see what the effects of, of decriminalizing marijuana can be. And, and they can say that essentially what this bill does is one step toward decriminalization. Colorado now leads the country in marijuana use by youth. Marijuana is related to one third of DUI crimes, driving under the intoxication cases in the state of Washington. Marijuana poisonings are up 148% since legalization in Colorado and 153% um, among uh, children ages 0 to 5. Um, most significantly, in 2015, in Denver, Colorado, drug crimes were up 12.5% and homicides were up 24% in Colorado. I've talked to that district attorney. He, he says it's related, it's all related to our legalization of marijuana. So we strongly oppose this bill. Um, in response to Senator Schmidt's questions to, to others about the, how the forfeiture process works in Missouri, it's important to know that no Missouri has a civil forfeiture proceeding. No civil forfeiture proceeding can even begin until the person is convicted of the crime, and then the state still bears by a preponderance of the evidence a standard to prove that that person uh, possessed some sort of drug um, that would allow forfeiture of his or her property. All right. Any questions? Thank you. So, and I, I acknowledge I think it's a different standard than the federal standard, which is this complete reversal of, right. of the burden. Um, and I know that with the changes that have taken place now, and I talked to some law enforcement about this, that, that you're really not going to see the pressures. Federal agencies because there's not there's not money to, to do it. But, um, so I just want to make sure I understand this. So you have to have a criminal conviction <coughs> first. That is correct. But does the state bear, which is probably at that point you've established what you probably need to establish in four terms? I want to understand the, the rationale. I can understand um, you know a drug lord um, having a compound. And that's where, you know, obviously this is the center of activity, and that makes sense to me. Um, in your estimation, how often are there forfeiture um, prosecutions that take place after the initial conviction? And the examples that were given by the criminal defense attorney, you got somebody growing 
um, a couple of plants and their farm is gone. Um, it would, it's, I suppose, allowable under the law, but in your experience, I don't mean to try to minimize it. But I'm sure that doesn't happen all that often, but I'm asking a lot of questions here once. Um, but explain to me the legal rather than trying to turn this into law school um, forum, but what's the legal rationale for this burden shifting if it does take place? If you're telling me it doesn't take place at the asset forfeiture, you know, we'll have to total explore that. So what's the rationale for that? Right. It, it doesn't take place at the state level. Okay. Or, and, and, and remember that the state law is entirely different from the federal law. Federal law uses an administrative forfeiture procedure. Missouri does not use that procedure. It's a civil procedure that can only proceed after the defendant has been convicted by a unanimous jury of 12 of his or her peers um, of the criminal offense. And you move to the civil side of it, it's just a preponderance, right? So it's, it's correct. Right. That's correct. But the um, state still bears that term. Right. Okay. And, and in addition, in, in response to your question, I can't speak to, to all of these uh, cases that, that uh, have been made. I don't know what the underlying facts of those cases were or were, were not. I can tell you, I've been prosecuting attorney of Platte County uh, for 13 years now. We have never done a forfeiture except when somebody is traveling uh, through a Platte County, usually on Interstate 29, with many, many pounds, usually hundreds of pounds of marijuana um, in that vehicle. Senator Shaver. Thanks. Uh, so, I mean, the issue, first of all, I mean, when you say shade on marijuana, you're probably getting a lot of consensus up here on that, but what we're talking about is civil forfeiture. We're not actually talking about conviction of the underlying crime of, of drug possession. <clears throat> so, I mean, we make a distinction between ill gotten gains, for example. So, let's say Senator Schmidt said, I mean, somebody's driving a you know, $200,000 Lamborghini that they bought with drug money. Do we distinguish between that and somebody that has the 100-year-old family farm that you know the teenager is growing five plants out of that 40 and nobody knows about, and suddenly the whole farm's in jeopardy? How do we make a distinction between ill-gotten gains, which I think is a different issue, than using the conviction as the ability to go after any associated property? Yeah, Missouri law does not currently make that decision, um, and so that because to me that's a, a distinction. And just like you said, I mean, look, you stop somebody on I-44, they got $40,000 in the trunk and some drugs. That's a different issue. And I think that everybody probably agrees with that. But the nexus between the drug activity and what's being forfeited is, is problematic. Because when you're looking at life, liberty, or property, I mean, obviously, you jeopardize losing your liberty on the underlying conviction. But then you risk losing your, your property, which also is constitutionally protected, on the forfeiture. And I, you know, and I know, and again, there are a lot of conservatives on who believe strongly in this issue that, that essentially you are taking you know, property with some serious constitutional implications when arguably we're not looking at build out gains and other things. It's simply a nexus between, well, you have an underlying drug conviction now, so what, what's attached to that? How do, how do you find that line? Yeah, I, I would tell you this that, that Missouri prosecutors do not oppose um, looking at our forfeiture um, statutes and looking at forfeiture reform in Missouri. We do oppose this specific reform because it doesn't get to, to exactly what, what your issue is. Your issue is something that, that we are quite willing uh, to discuss. And I think this is, is a very important question, sir. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to testify in opposition? Good afternoon. Stephen Cordy, Sheriff of High County, Missouri, representing the Missouri Sheriff's Association, and we are in opposition to this bill. Um, a lot of good testimony questions so far, but one of the things you look at here is, you know, marijuana is an illegal substance. Um, you know, when everybody's talking about a joint here or a joint there, but, you know, this all, this bill limits all marijuana. So. Tractor trailer load full of marijuana coming by 44 was faced the same as some of the joints. And like I said, this bill doesn't address it. This just takes marijuana completely out of the system. Um, you're, you're basically treating a marijuana drug dealer versus a heroin or something else. You're, you're giving preferential treatment to one drug dealer. Um, you know, I guess the larger issue as far as marijuana goes, um, you know, I, I've spoken with sheriffs from Colorado. You know. Yeah, there, there was, well, there's a tone or change in marijuana in this country, but you know, marijuana now is 25 to 35 times more stronger than the marijuana from 
the 60s. Um, you know, Dr. Onder, you know, we talk about, you know, smoking, you know, probably partially because of the illegal nature. I mean, we haven't looked at the long-term effects. You know, we looked at the long-term effects of cigarette smoke. You know, it's been proven that cigarette companies have added things to make that more addictive. You know, same thing, you know, we don't have studies on marijuana as far as, you know, the you know, legitimate medical uses and things like that. Um, you know, speaking with, you know, I have spoken with sheriffs from Colorado and stuff, you know, you've got a situation there where legitimate people that are selling marijuana are being strong-armed by the cartels. You know, we know where you live, we know who your family are, you will give us, pay us money. You know, and then on top of that, you know, you've got, you have, you buy your marijuana legally, you have a legal package that says you bought this legally. There's nothing stopping people from taking illegal marijuana, selling back in that same package, and transiting, transiting around their state. Um, that's one of the biggest issues. You know, as far as the forfeiture, um, you know, Missouri, in my opinion, does not have a forfeiture issue as far as marijuana or other things because of the fact that, you know, it is much more difficult. You have to file your petition, you know, to forfeit some property in a drug case within two days. It's not something you, you convict somebody six months, a year down the road, and you come back and try to take their vehicle or their car or their property or anything else. It's something that's done very minimally. Um, I think only extreme cases because, you know, the money all goes to the schools, it's correct. But on, on the reverse side, once the school receives those money, the state withholds that amount of money from the school district the next year. So, you know, school districts aren't pushing for this. You're not seeing law enforcement or prosecutors pushing for this. You know, only in extreme cases do you see, in my opinion, forfeitures. You know, in my seven years of sheriff, we've done two forfeitures involving marijuana. Uh, the first one was a guy that was had about 15 plants in the backyard growing in pots, and he claimed the birds dropped the seeds in the pots and grew naturally. Any questions? Okay. Any questions for the chair? Senator. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, sir, for testimony. I, I was told that, uh, and this is anecdotal, so I don't know uh, whether it's an accurate representation or whether it's perceived, but I was told, that, for example, in California, uh, if you walk into a place to buy marijuana, there would be a rack that has medicinal, and there would be a rack that has non medicinal. Um, I guess I don't know if there's any difference, and I don't know if the difference might be in those other than the tax treatment. And if someone says, and they'll say, you can either buy the tax or you can buy the tax. And they'll say, well, I'll take it cheaper, I'll take it tax, and they'll say, well, you need this red card to get that. And they might say, well, I don't have a red card. And you'll say, well, there's a doctor next year where you can go get one and come back. Uh, do you know if that is the kind of uh, how it's being handled in states like California? I'm not very familiar with that, no, sir. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Anyone else to testify in this issue? Last call. Then I'll close the hearing on the Senate Bill 761. Thank you very much. I just want to say I'm sorry. You can't be like that. I would. You know, there are people, thank you, Mr. Chair. There there are people who study marijuana every single day. And they can tell you that this is one of the drugs where. Um, you are not violent whatsoever. There are plenty of people that I have known who utilize marijuana for therapy. And um, we don't always smoke it, but what we are realizing in some of these urban areas is that people are being penalized for not a lot. And there, I think there are a couple of big points that were made in terms of the amount. Um, but there are people who are just living their lives a small quantity and they're being penalized for the rest of their life. And I just don't think that should happen and I believe that everyone should be redeemed. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Senator. We will now open the hearing on Senate Bill 916, Senator Schaefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the record, Senator Kirk Schaefer, 916. Um, basically, what this bill does is the Missouri Human Rights Act, uh, there's a definition of employer. There's been an exemption in the law for the Missouri Human Rights Act for religious organizations. What's happened is um, the Human Rights Commission has promulgated a rule, and then 
uh, in 2013, there was a Missouri Supreme Court case dealing with that rule and further definition, which really ratchets down the definition of a religious organization as being exempt from the law. And so what this bill is an attempt to do is clarify. And, you know, I, I know this, this bill has been presented as an LGBT issue. That's currently not something that's protected under the Missouri Human Rights Act. I guess someday in the future it could be. But that's really not the issue here. The issue is overall whether or not uh, employment laws in some way interfere with religious organizations uh, help deeply held religious beliefs. And so when we've seen some of the things that have come out of the Supreme Court recently, changing the law in the United States and in the state of Missouri, you know, this is where the rubber hits the road if you're a religious organization. This, this is whether or not in the First Amendment you have the ability to practice your religion without government interference or not. And so what this attempts to do is redefine the definition of employer to make sure that the exemption for religious organizations that was originally in this bill and has always been is truly interpreted by the courts and, and employers and employees as being an exemption. Um, I've worked with Professor Esbeck on this bill. He's here. Uh, he'll be the first witness. You know, I'm, I'm open to discussion on this bill of what ultimately the language looks like. But that is the purpose of the bill. And I think we need to make sure that as we are in kind of this new frontier of defining religious liberty in context of more recent court decisions, you know, we have to make sure as the Missouri legislature that religious organizations are protected and that their deeply held religious beliefs are not interfered with unnecessarily by the government. That's, that's what this bill is about. It's the forefront and it's where the rubber meets the road on this issue. And we're going to have to de define where that line is. So again, um, you know, Professor Esbeck can testify uh, as to certain things here in the language and much better than I can. But I think we ultimately will have to determine what did that exemption mean when you put it in there uh, originally, and what's it going to be in the future? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions for the sponsor? Senator Kevin. Thank you. Very good. The, the way you explained it, the court uh, narrowly uh, construed a rule that was promulgated by the commission. Yeah, so the commission promulgated a rule that basically said to be a exempt religious organization, there's a couple things that have to take place, including the entity has to be owned and operated by a religious group, and then every member of that organization has to be an adherent or a member of that religious organization. So number one, that was the narrowing down by the Human Rights Commission, but then on top of that, the court went into that prong of ownership that's in the rule, right. and said because the hospital, the religious hospital that was in, in, in question there, St. Francis Medical Center, was in fact owned by a C4. The court said a C4 can't own anything. So in fact, it wasn't owned by anybody apparently, and therefore the rule was not flipped. And that's, you know, I, I don't agree with that. I think that's a stretch. But that's the kind of thing that we're going to have to define, I think, to make sure we have clarity so that there is sufficient protection for religious liberty. I mean, I, I was trying to get you to uh, comment on why not just rewrite the rule. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's face it, the rule, the rule is an executive branch, under an executive branch you know, yeah. agency, and they may have a different view than we have, and I think that it's our role as the legislature to articulate what we intended to do with the exemption of the original statute, and not leave it to an executive branch agency to somehow find it by rule. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. You want to call your first? Yeah, you call the test aspect, please. That's true. Welcome, sir. Uh, good afternoon. For the record, uh, Carl Hesbeck. I'm a member of the faculty at the University of Missouri. Uh, my title there is uh, uh, Professor of Law Emeritus, and I like to teach in the area of church state relations, constitutional law, federal civil rights uh, litigation. Uh, as Senator Colbert said, <clears throat> we got um, just recently from the Missouri Supreme Court uh, somewhat of a technical reading, and it was a reading not just of uh, the commission's regulation, but of the statute itself. The statute passed by this body back in the 1970s. And the statute, the Supreme Court said, was defective because it required, in order to enjoy the religious exemption, you had to be owned and operated. Well, the court said it's impossible to own a nonprofit corporation. Nobody owns it. A for profit, of course, is owned by the shareholders, but a nonprofit isn't owned, <clears throat> isn't owned by anybody. So, in essence, the, uh, the religious exemption evaporated completely. In doing that, they overturned a 31-year-old precedent, which had 
uh, interpreted that very same language much more generously. So we have a, a, a you know a technical reading, and in essence, the, the Missouri Supreme Court has pushed the ball back to your court to uh, to fix this particular religious uh, uh, exemption. But let me just uh, pause. Other witnesses uh, who actually represent religious organizations can testify to this better than me. But we have kind of an absurd. Uh, all 50 states, minus one now, minus Missouri, exempts religious organizations to some extent from the Human Rights Act. So we have this kind of an absurd situation that a church can't say, in order to be a secretary of a church, you have to be a member of the church. That's absurd. You, if you want to run a, a, a Lutheran K-12 school, you can't require them to teach you to be Lutheran. That's kind of a absurd result that we have right now. So we obviously have to put something back in its particular place. So in order to, to be a religious organization, you have to hold yourself out to the public as religious. You also have to have a religious purpose, and you have to engage in religious activities. All of those are the hoops that you need to jump through. Also in that uh, uh, the bill's definition of religious organization, it deals with a difference in polity or ecclesiology, which is uh, different between Catholic and Protestant. If you're Catholic, um, all of the, the pertinent schools and, and ancillary social service organizations, Catholic charities and so on, are all tied into the church in some way. But in Protestantism, it's quite common to have a holy religious ministry, but it's freestanding. It's not captive of any church or denomination. Uh, that's very common among uh, uh, Protestant Christian schools, for example, uh, the uh, College of the Ozarks down in the, in the Southwest uh, is, is quite religious, but it isn't associated with any denomination. Uh, and, and so so the definition saying, well, you don't have to have this connection or relation to uh, deals with and, and brings those Protestant groups within in that particular definition, all of which is to say this definition has. I'm sorry, we have to go to questions to be consistent here. Any questions for the professor? I do have one. Um, can you can you give us? I, I certainly see where what you lay out here before. So we're the only state now as a result of this decision, and, and it wasn't a per se a lawsuit it was an administrative rule change. I understand you said that. <laughs> there, were two went the lawsuit. there were two things. The commission had an administrative rule that actually read the statute over the narrow. But the court based its decision on two points separately. And, and the one that you have to deal with is they said, look, put aside what the commission said. The, the General Assembly back in the 70s said, in order to get this exemption, you have to be owned and operated by a religious group. And it is impossible, says the Missouri Supreme Court, to be a, for a non-profit organization to be owned by anybody. So there you are. So my other question, and that, that, that kind of explains it. Um, my other question is, can you give us <clears throat> and I'm, I hesitate to ask for just because it is, I know it can't really be um, refined perhaps since the time that we have, but historically you do touch on uh, the differences there um, pertaining to Catholic tradition versus Protestant tradition. But are there more, um, how can this? Can you give us just kind of a summary of historically why we find ourselves in this place um, with regard to kind of a merging of church and state, if you will? We, my word, we have to do this institution exerting authority over the church, perhaps, any church. Well, in the country that has celebrated the separation of church and state, how are we here? Aside from the court case, I mean, um, it just seems ironic that we're having this discussion. Well, back in the 1970s, 
as late 1960s as well. The phrase of passing the human rights acts. Um, they were defining what, what, who, who was an employer subject to the act. And naturally, religious groups came forward for reasons of separation of church and state, which you correctly identified and said, well, we, we too are employers, but you don't want to regulate us for reasons of separation of church and state. And because it's obviously a religious liberty problem, if you're telling a Lutheran school you can't just hire Lutheran teachers, that's, that's a major, rather obvious uh, uh, religious uh, problem. So they exempted religious organizations. And that was just fine in Missouri with a precedent that stood uh, well for 31 years, but the Supreme Court recently rejected that precedent and said, no, we're going to read this statute literally, which technically was infected. It is true. Nobody owns a nonprofit organization. So, so in essence, that technicality, that language, which is been there for 45 years, uh, was defective. The Supreme Court wasn't going to give you a pass. The ball's back in your court. I would hope that you again honor separation of church and state and put back in a, uh, you know, a reasonable uh, religious organization exemption. Any questions? Any further questions for the professor? Thank you, sir. I would like to ask for a show of hands. How many intend to testify in support of this bill? How many intend to testify in opposition? Okay. I think what we're going to do is uh, deviate just a little bit from our uh, standard procedure here, and we'll take testimony in an alternating fashion. So I'm now call for uh, anyone that would like to testify in opposition. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, I'm Eric Kriegel. I'm with the Missouri Commission on Human Rights. And the uh, commission is uh, testifying against this bill because it feels that it could jeopardize our receipt of federal funds from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EOC. And we're able to contract with the EOC because they have analyzed the Missouri Human Rights Act and determined that it is substantially equivalent with the federal civil rights laws that the EOC enforces. <clears throat> and when they reviewed um, Senate Bill 916, they had some concerns that uh, it would make the exception much broader than the religious exception, say, in Title VII of the ADA. And that could threaten our ability to contract with the EEOC. And we received a you know, substantial portion of our budget from the EEOC, uh, $760,000. Senator. So, um, the, the testimony earlier was that there are 49 states that have religious exemptions to their human rights statutes, and you did just allude yourself to the Title IX religious exceptions. Have you worked with the bill sponsor to craft a, uh, a, 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 a religious exemption that would not be problematic? Um, I have not, sir. I do have a letter from the EOC um, outlining their concerns that I've attached to my witness um, form. Okay, thank you. I have just one question. We have, uh, my time in the Senate, at least, we have had a number of bills dealing with the Human Rights, Missouri Human Rights Act. Many of them actually dealt with business uh, related topics. And I believe that the Commission has come on a number of occasions and made that same argument. Are you aware of any legislation that has Sought to alter the Missouri Human Rights Act, where you all did not testify, or were you justified in favor? Um, not off the top of my head. Um, we, when we get feedback from EEOC or from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, we have concerns about the, the legislation that could impact our ability to contract and receive the federal funds. We can testify to that effect. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, sir. Thank you. Mr. And I have seen the EEOC letter. There's no suggestions on how to make the bill better. It's just we don't like the bill. 
but I'd be happy to share them with the uh, entire committee. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will now take the witness and support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Lance Ginzer. I'm the policy director for the group called the First Amendment Partnership, a national group that works with some of the nation's largest faith communities on issues of common concern related to the issue of religious liberty. I just want to make a, a couple of points. The reason we're here today is because of some points that have already been made, which is to say that this chair uh, of the St. Francis Medical Center opinion was issued by the Missouri Supreme Court. Uh, is, a, at least in our reading, uh, unique and, and, and troubling with respect to the position that leaves the citizens, particularly religious institutions in Missouri, and when compared to similarly situated entities in other states. Uh, our reading of Senate Bill 916 is that it serves really just to restore the pre era status quo while clarifying the extent of the religious exemption with, frankly, I think will be helpful uh, to courts and legal practitioners as they attempt to apply uh, that particular exception. By defining it more specificity, I think you actually reduce the likelihood of future litigation, which is really important because it goes to a core point that's been made, which is the reason the history of these exemptions for religious groups uh, in civil rights acts at the federal level in state laws with respect to human rights has always related to the understanding that there's something inherently um, unseemly about the state interjecting itself into the hiring practices of religious entities. You know, the United States Supreme Court has recognized repeatedly in a variety of contexts the idea that religious exemptions from civil rights or human rights acts are appropriate and actually further um, and Justice Ginsburg, for example, in the unanimous decision in Cutter v. Wilkerson, which is 544 U.S. 709 for attorneys here, I commend it to your attention, talked about the fact that the court has long recognized that government may accommodate religious practices without violating the establishment clause, and in fact, that those very accommodations work within what she called the, the room for play within the joints of the free exercise clause and the establishment clause in order to further and protect religious liberty. And then Justice White, in another case I commend the committee's attention, presiding bishop the Amos, which is 483 U.S. 1987, Justice White put even a finer point on it when he said that exemptions of this type serve the important purpose of avoiding undue government entanglement in the hiring practices of religious groups. And what I would note is, took a look at the laws of states like Illinois, Tennessee, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, just some surrounding states, um, and what's clear is that under the Faro opinion, citizens in Missouri, with the religious institutions in Missouri, enjoy now much less freedom from entanglement um, than is the case even in surrounding states. And so I think it makes good sense as a public policy matter to address this in a legislative context. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Next in opposition. Thank you, uh, Chairman Nixon. My name is Paul Bullman. I'm an attorney in Kansas City. I also went to Catholic school for 13 years. And I understand from Senator Schaefer, who I have met many agreements with, actually, with many on uh, actually this uh, committee. Um, the issue with this bill is that it excludes religious organizations from anything involving the MHR. It's not about religious liberty when we deal with, for instance, teachers who are sexually active at school. They are no longer protected under state law with this bill. It's not religious liberty when we have students who are sexually active at school. They're not protected under this bill. Under federal law and under the First Amendment, which of course we all have to agree, the First Amendment trumps MHRA, uh, there are exceptions and protections for legitimate religious liberties. For instance, uh, Professor Esbeck gave the example of you're a Lutheran school, you should be allowed to hire just Lutherans to teach church doctrine. I have no issue with that. I think that's fair. The issue here, though, that I have, and I'm speaking on behalf of Matt, but more so myself and my past, the issue I have is I don't believe any uh, teacher or student 
um, janitor or anyone else who works at a Catholic school or a Protestant school or any religious school should now not have the same rights as those who are at OB government schools. The same applies for hospitals. You know, a nurse or a janitor or a doctor or someone else who works at a religious hospital, which many are, that's where my child was born, a religious hospital, um, they're no longer protected under the MHR with us either. So now all of a sudden they can be discriminated against. They can be chosen based on their race. They can be sexually harassed. You know, federal law protects, um, in the limited way federal law does, these issues. But now state law would no longer protect that. And that's a major problem. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But this is a, I'm, I'm part, I don't mean to interrupt. I'd be happy to work with Senator Schaefer on trying to craft this in a way that I think addresses the concerns that are being raised that I think are legitimate. And I, I would note that I think I've spoken in front of this committee three times over the last six years on religious liberty issues because I represent people who are denied their religious liberties at work. That's not the entire of my practice. It's a good part of my practice. So for instance, Sunday accommodation, people have been denied it. I've fought for that. So I'm generally pro-religious liberty, but this is not sexual harassment, race discrimination is not religious liberty. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Thank you. My name is George Paul Wood. I am the Religious Freedom Initiatives Coordinator for the General Council of the Assemblies of God, which is headquartered in Springfield, Missouri, and I'm speaking on behalf, obviously, of Senate Bill Number 916. As a rule of thumb, the General Counsel doesn't comment pro or for or against pending points of legislation. However, we do feel that a fix in the Missouri Human Rights Act is needed for the legal reasons pointed out by Professor Denbeck and also uh, by Lance Kinzer. Um, to give some sense of the uh, Assemblies of God's uh, concerns about that, you need to understand that not only is the Assemblies of God, is the Assemblies of God a denomination, our national office is located in Springfield, Missouri. We have two district councils located in Missouri. Um, so not only can we operate 461 churches with 100,000 adherents in Springfield, Missouri, um, but in addition to which, the General Council of the Assemblies of God owns and operates, uh, or at least we think we own and operate under the law, it's not clear that we do own and operate, two accredited universities. We also own and operate the Assemblies of God Financial Services. Uh, the Assemblies of God Foundation, or any number of ministries uh, that the Assemblies of God operates, which are not local congregations. And if I'm understanding the problem with this, uh, with the Pharaoh decision that it creates for the Assemblies of God and its affiliated entities, uh, it, it means that even those institutions, such as educational institutions, which are owned and operated by the General Council of the Assemblies of God, um, could be sued under. Missouri Human Rights Act for a variety of violations. The previous person who testified, for instance, mentioned twice, what about the student who has sex after school, or the teacher has sex after school. And we actually have sexual conduct codes, both in our employment contracts and in our student body and employee uh, contracts with our schools that regulate sexual conduct. It's a little bit scary to suggest that maybe but that is not uh, uh, something that we can do legally um, simply because somebody else doesn't consider that fair. Uh, the General Council of Assemblies of God, all of its entities are voluntary organizations. They are not opposed by anybody. People join will willingly. And when they do join willingly, they also agree to certain sets of documents and conduct codes that govern their behavior. And so given the scope of this problem, potentially, thankfully, nobody has had the the temerity to uh, try to go after church institutions or whatnot. Thankfully, I think everybody understands that that would be a foolish move. Uh, we do think, however, that this law does need to be fixed to clarify that just as uh, um, federal law exempts religious organizations from uh, um, certain uh, uh, civil rights uh, provisions, uh, the Missouri legislature should also do the same and bring its laws into line with those of the other United States. So again, we speak in favor of this bill. Thank you. George, it's good to see you, sir. Thank you, Senator. Um, you, you certainly effectively raised the flip side of the argument, and that is, by not doing this, we would essentially be limiting what you could uh, 
voluntarily regulate it yourselves. That's what they might exchange for that. Yes. Any questions? Okay. We will now take the witness in opposition. Uh, good afternoon, Senators. For the record, Sarah Rossi with the ACLU of Missouri. We are here in opposition to the bill. I'm also representing Promo today, who couldn't be here in person. They're also in opposition to the bill. And I also have written testimony from the NAACP of Missouri, who couldn't be here in person, who's also in opposition to the bill. We can accept your testimony for the record. For those that are not here, since they were not here to answer questions, I cannot listen to the witness. I will distribute to you. It's not for me to read and know that they're at. Okay. Just so we're clear. For um, everyone in the room. Our opposition to the bill is very similar to Matt's opposition. I agree that there should be a reasonable definition in the Missouri Human Rights Act for the religious exemption. Um, in a previous hearing and this hearing, I'll say again, yeah, we agree that um, clergy and churches should have an exemption from certain laws so that their religious liberties are protected. We feel that's the purpose of the First Amendment. Our issue with this particular definition of employer in the Missouri Human Rights Act is that it's very, very broad. And it will allow any number of organizations to discriminate based on things like race and gender with absolutely no liability or responsibility for those actions. Um, for example, just as I was sitting back there, I was thinking about organizations who could be religiously affiliated or may not be religiously affiliated, but consider themselves to be religious in nature, like women's shelters, daycares, thrift stores, homeless shelters, preschools, hospitals, hospice care, nursing homes, independent living centers, adoption services, foster care placement. All of those things could be religiously affiliated, but could just be independent organizations or nonprofits that are operating and want to operate a specific way, and that could be discriminating, discriminating against people, <coughs> discriminating against women, etc. And then decide to hold themselves out to be religious in the community and say that their services are religious in nature because if they're offering social services, I think there's an argument to make there. My issue with the definition specifically is that it doesn't just cover organizations that are religiously affiliated, it covers all of these different types of social services, including the one I, I would say, including the ones I listed, whether or not connected to or affiliated with a church convention, denomination, or other organization with churches, and then basically says they can just hold themselves out to be in whole or in part religious and be exempted from the Missouri Human Rights Act. So that's what worries me, is that there does need to be a definition. I agree with Senator Schaefer on that, but the definition needs to be narrow enough that we're not encouraging organizations to hold themselves out to be religious and we're going to discriminate on the basis of race or gender or disability or any other number of things. To address the Senator's concern that the LGBT community is um, raising awareness about this bill, we're fully confident that at some point LGBT people will be included in the Human Rights Act and when that day comes we prefer that they not be discriminated against uh, to this level. So that's why the, the alarm has been raised in that. <laughs> okay. Any questions for Sarah? Thank you. Oh, it's Senator, I'm sorry. So, um, this is, I, I guess you came up here wearing three hats, so I'm going to ask you a question for your final hat. Do you have any final? I know that we've taken up language at different times in the past about um, adding an LGBT to uh, protect the public status <coughs> under the Missouri Human Rights Act. Is that the sort of thing that Pomo might want to see happen with a vehicle like this potentially? Um, I think Pomo would like to see LGBT people added to the Missouri Human Rights Act. Carte Blanche, I'm not sure that this. Tell me what you mean by that. I mean, I'm, I'm, are you saying in conjunction with something like this? Right, right, yeah. Um, we wouldn't be willing to weaken the protections for crews who are already protected. Well, the certainly not. No, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. Mm -hmm. I'm just suggesting, I mean, like legislation would say you can't be fired for being gay. Would that be? That would be delightful. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. <coughs> We will now take a witness in support. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a privilege to be able to speak to the committee today. My name is Don Hinkle. I'm 
the director of public policy for the largest non-Catholic denomination in the state of Missouri. The 2,000 churches and there are 650,000 members of the Missouri Baptist Convention. And just here today to express our support for the speech Thank you. Any questions for Don? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, in opposition. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and uh, Pam Oxford for Empower Missouri. I'm not sure that we have anything new to add. It hasn't been said already, but we'd like to go on record in opposition. Good question, Mr. Thank you. Next in support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is Michael Whitehead. I'm an attorney in private law practice in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of the Missouri Baptist Convention. He's one of my clients, and I'm the general counsel for the convention. So I've been practicing law generally for just about a little bit over now, 40 years. I thought this morning as I left the Capitol Plaza Hotel and saw down in the lobby hundreds of young law students taking the Missouri Bar today. And I wanted to say a word of prayer for them. They have no idea what they're getting into. Uh, but I also thought about this bill. If they were given a copy of this statute as one of their essay exams and said, interpret and analyze this statute, that to be a, an exempt employer in Missouri, you must be a religious organization that's, uh, or if, you, if you're a nonprofit corporation, you must be owned and operated by a religious denomination, convention association, etc. I think they would all miss that question. Uh, and the legislature missed the answer to that question when in your collective wisdom, you passed this law and then you were graded a person by a very stern English professor or a set of professors at the Missouri Supreme Court, where they said, if you had just said that it must be either owned or operated, then St. Francis Medical Center was in fact exempt from all of the categories of discrimination that the man of witness talked about. That's been the protection for religious organizations from the beginning. You're not changing that. The executive branch passed the regulation that said we're going to be tougher than that. You have to be 100% owned by a nonprofit. The nonprofit corporation has to be 100% owned by a religious organization. Well, everyone got it wrong except the Missouri Supreme Court. And people in my local Baptist church, if they were asked who owns the church, and they said, well, think about that. God owns it. Does the preacher own it? Do we as members own it? And I said, no, nobody owns it. They'd say, are you kidding me? What are you smoking? But that's the prior bill, of course. We were all thinking. Yeah, exactly. Right. This is a hyper-technical correction by the Missouri Supreme Court Act in the Zimbabwe State. And they're saying you need to change that word to or, and that could fix this measure. But then the regulators and the executive branch would continue to pull out regulations as what they think it ought to mean in order to try to narrow the scope. But this is a legislative decision by the elected representatives of the people of Missouri who have always said, not because they think it's a good idea, let's protect religion from government interference. It's because the Constitution commands it. And the chairman asked a good question. Why didn't the Supreme Court just say, you know, the statute wasn't clear enough about what gives this uh, Christian hospital protection? The Constitution should have protected, but they didn't go there. They gutted the religious liberty protections of charitable organizations by saying you should have said or instead of and. And so uh, Senator Schaefer has wisely gone beyond the detail required by the English professor and has proposed some language that will prevent further litigation and further confusion by the courts in the future. And we certainly fully support, on behalf of the Missouri Baptist Convention, as Don Hinkle mentioned, uh, this correction of your essay exam, which we think was right in the first place, but correct it for the prop, and you should get an A. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ch
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to mention this earlier, but since you brought up the bar exam, I'll take this opportunity to thank Professor Espec for doing such a great job in my bar review, getting me geared up for the constitutional law section. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Next in opposition. Next in opposition. Anyone else to testify against the bill? Next in favor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senators, for the record, if we're messed with the Missouri Family Network, we want to record and support the legislation. The only thing that I would add to all the excellent testimony that we've had previously was, Senators, you have an opportunity to answer the question, a very simple question, are we or are we not going to protect religious expression in our state? Good question. Thank you. Anyone else to testify in support? Okay, that will close the hearing on Senate Bill 96. Thank you. I um, was not planning to accept today on anything. Okay. Um, possibly we will have an exec session later in the week. Um, I think I'm going to do that today, so I will take a motion to adjourn.